and welcome back to this week's Live from the Clinic. And we are going to have a really lovely next half hour listening to some crazy stories, I'm sure, from a man who has climbed Everest no less than 14 times. Um, Kenton, I don't really know where to start. <laughs> I spent the weekend reading this great book um, uh, and actually laughed until I cried at, so maybe we'll start there, with the story about when you got to Everest the, the first time, you got to the summit and you phoned your mum. Oh, uh, when I phoned my mum from the top, well, first of all, thanks for having me on, uh, <laughs> on the show. It's very kind words about the book. I know you're lying. Um, I, know it's, I know it's literally garbage. Um, that's why for all those that bought the book. Um, but yeah, when I first summit did Everest back in 2004, oh, it's brilliant. So it, it, try, try and imagine the scene. There was quite a lot of stress and anxiety on the expedition. I'd never been to Everest before. I'm operating as a commercial leader, so people have paid money for me to look after them. I've never been above 8,000 metres, so that environment was quite new. And we ended up fixing the rope on summit day to get to the top. So th there's a lot of things which were very much outside our comfort zone, our sort of sphere of confidence, um, uh, not confidence, but um, competence. And uh, anyway, we, we finally get to the top and I, I get there f ahead of my client uh, and, and my lovely Sherpa gave me a, maybe 100 yards, 50 yards. So I get to the top on my own and I'm the first person there of the year. And I can just remember looking around and being utterly awestruck by my own achievements, which sounds very vain, the achievements of the team, the historical context of the first ascent of Everest back in 53, the early attempts in the 20s, the magnificent vista was overpowering. Powering. Um, <laughs> it, was, it, was just, it was almost too hard to compute what was going on. And I thought, right, I'm going to... I had a sat phone. I'm going to phone my parents. And I get my parents on the phone. Now, remember, there's a time delay not a time delay, a, a time difference. Obviously, Nepal is, is oddly, I think it's four hours 45 ahead of the UK. 15 minutes difference. They're like a little bit of difference from India. Go figure. And uh, so it's about four hours 45 difference. And, uh, and we're summited at eight o'clock in the morning, nine o'clock in the morning. So it's very early in the UK. <laughs> and I ring and I get my mother and she's like, oh, hello, dear. And I had a chest infection. So I was recovering from a chest infection, so I cough and splutter a bit in the phone. You go, oh, before I can say anything, you go, oh, dear, how is that chest infection of yours? I'm like, mum, mum, yeah, it's great. Yeah, 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 yeah chest infection, <laughs> it's better, it's better, thanks. Yeah, it's okay. Oh, brilliant. Yes, thanks. Oh, that's nice, dear. Now, now, now where are you? <laughs> I'm like, mum, I mean, where, where, is she, where is she expecting me to be? I'm like, mum, mum, I'm, I'm on the top, I'm on the summit. She's like, oh, that's... That's nice, dear. Now, unfortunately, your father couldn't sleep, so he's taken the dog out. Is there any chance you can call back? <laughs> like in maybe 10, 15 minutes when he's back. Like, mm, I'm not sure that's going to be possible, Mum. Um, I'm, I'm, on, I, I'm, I'm on the top of Yes, I know, dear. Yes, well, do try and speak to your dad, won't you? I'm like, yeah, OK, thanks, Mum. And it was that... Pulling back to reality that only a mother can do. I mean, she wasn't squashing <laughs> enjoyment or ambition. I suppose it's more careful nurturing of a situation. Flesh. And all of a sudden, yeah, from my, my mind being like egotistical <laughs> and in the clouds, it's now very much back focused on the task in hand. And interestingly, because I, I did not realised this, you said that you weren't... If technically, if you're being pedantic, you, want, you weren't standing on the top of Everest, and in fact, and in fact nobody has. Is that correct? Uh, well, no, it's not a case of nobody has. I think people do. I, I personally have never stood on the tippy top. So the tippy top of Everest is it, it's actually quite small. Uh, and it's a, 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 like, it's a slight sort of whale back, probably about the same sort of size as a, I'm making it up a little bit, like a porpoise. Okay. Uh, it's, it's certainly not much you know, longer than these two metres between us, and, it, and it's humped. Uh, and if this is the, the way that I would come up from the Nepalese side, that going down the other way would be to uh, Chinese Tibet. The drop-off down your side is 
3,000 meters, boof, down, you know, back down into Tibet and this side. So people generally congregate normally on this side because it's slightly easier angled. And very few people actually get on to the tippy top. I've never done it out of, I, I'm not religious really, but I'm, I've got quite a spiritual heart. Mm -hmm. And I've always subconsciously thought it was not really the done thing to stand on top. And it's really interesting because the third highest mountain in the world, Kanchenjunga, uh, which is in the far uh, east of Nepal, the uh, Indian-Nepali border, for many years thought to be the highest mountain in the world because you can see it from Darjeeling. Um, there is a, an unwritten pact of, among climbers that you don't stand on the top. It is the abode of gods. And the locals would actually ask you to, to be respectful and not stand on the top. Everest doesn't really have that. As a mark of respect from my Sherpa friends, I haven't stood on the top, but I think perhaps deep down, maybe I'm also a little bit scared of standing on top. Because it is, you don't, you don't want to fall off. Oh, I don't think you're scared of anything. <laughs> everybody says that Everest is a walk, but there are certain places, the top being one, if you fell off from there, you're not coming back anytime soon. Not even your skills as a doctor are going to bring somebody back to life. Well, um, and you've had your brush with medicine. I mean, you had a really serious injury very early on in your climbing career, didn't you? Yeah, I, I wouldn't actually say it was a climbing career back then. Uh, more a, yeah, I, I was like an amateur climber. And not to say I, I had amateurish skills or techniques. I was quite accomplished. But yeah, you're right. I fell off rock climbing in North Wales. Hit the ground from not so high. Uh, but managed to uh, shatter both my heel bones, called, called a bilateral cocaine fracture. Uh, and I think I did a pretty good job. So this one was in about, so this is my right leg. i hold it up. You know, see it. Uh, <laughs> uh, this one was in about 14 pieces, I think, and the other one in seven or eight. No, I've seen the x-rays. Uh, good job. <laughs> and I was, um, uh, yeah, first of all, treated in Bangor Hospital. So uh, we're in the slate quarries, which is a little bit awkward to get to. And, the, and they're wonderful. Like, all my treatment was on the NHS, and they did a, a bloody marvellous job, to be frank. And there's so many great stories from being in hospital. It is, it's marvellous. Um, but the first thing that happened was that the, the ambulance crew, like, some friends of mine got me down essentially to the road, and then the ambulance crew took over. And the first thing the ambulance crew managed to do was, uh, I'm lying on a stretcher, or, or the cat, no, that's it, they're carrying me. And then they put me in some funny chair thing to then, that sort of springs into the, uh, and they managed to sort of smash my feet on the side <laughs> of the door. So they're like, oh! And the other thing they wanted to do was cut off my boots and harness. Because uh, when my feet immediately start to swell up, and I've got my climbing boots on, which are notoriously tight. And I, um, I'd just finished being a student, so I was penniless. And the last thing I was going to allow anybody to do was cut my harness. So I'm there trying desperately through gritted teeth to get my boots and harness off. And then, of course, you get given the gas and air or whatever they call it and happy days. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, you were told, I think, weren't you, that you would never walk again, leave alone climb. Yeah, but I think, yeah, yeah I was. Uh, but I think those things are, are, are all relative to a certain extent. It was actually writing the book that made me think a little bit about the drive that I, that I have had post-accident. And I wonder how much of it does come down to one particular uh, consultant who did say that any form of climbing, I wouldn't walk without a stick. Uh, I would have a permanent limp, which I kind of do. I would never run. Mm. And he left me in tears. I mean, he, my life at that time was climbing. My social life, everything was focused on climbing. And of course, that had just been destroyed in about three lines by a doctor. I was distraught. And it was really interesting that his registrar, after they'd done the rounds, he came back in later, just on his own, and apologised for his consultant, saying that his consultant was perhaps being a, a little bit rash on his prognosis and maybe with enough fortitude and resilience, I would get walking again. Uh, but as I say, it's revisited in the to book. to tell him that you've been... <laughs> no, but I, I used to send, I don't know if you ever received them, I used to send postcards to the guy that 
um, that essentially put me back together eventually was uh, Bob Hanley at the John Radcliffe, who retired three or four years ago, I believe. And uh, an amazing doctor, considered to be one of the best orthopedics in that. I don't quite know how they're breaking down like foot injury yeah. orthopedic stuff. Yeah. Um, and he does all this stuff on the NHS, on the majority. And he, he did the second or third operations. And he put it in a much simpler way for me. He said, I'm going to rebuild your feet so that you can wear shoes that aren't um, specially modified. And then more than that, it's down to you down to your hard work and, and where you want to get to. So, which was the top of Everest. <laughs> which, which was the top of Everest. And as I said, I used to send in postcards. Excellent. Um, dear Bob Hanley, just stood on top of the world. But, but I didn't, never had an address. It was just like John Radcliffe. <laughs> uh, he'll have got them. I hope sure. so. I'm sure he'll I hope so. Them. I do owe him a massive um, debt. And you talk about meeting the Sir Alan Fines and saying to him... I didn't, look, I, I, I didn't meet him. I, I, I kept him alive for about six, well, seven years. I was going to say, and you also said to him that Everest wasn't the most tricky. Moment. I did, yeah. Um, Tell me and more it's about not. That. So we were on a, I was an aspirant mountain guide, so a trainee mountain guide. Back in 2005, I think it was. Well, maybe it was four. Yeah, maybe it was 2004. Anyway, Rand Fines was on, yeah, it would have been 2004. And Rand Fines was doing a training course with a company I was working for as a mountain guide. And he was one of my heroes, or still is one of my heroes. And um, I saw him then in the group. I turned up late as ever. I, I, for those of you watching, I almost turned up late for this. <laughs> I think poor Ben in the background there was the <laughs> ever more frantic telephone. We are going live at three o'clock, Kenton. <laughs> I was driving. That's why I couldn't get back to you, Ben. Um, <laughs> And I saw, I saw Ran in the, uh, everybody sat down for dinner and I came rushing in. And I saw Ran straight away. I didn't know he was going to be on the course. And I'm a firm believer that there's so much we can learn from other people. And what we need to do is get ourselves in the right position to, to learn from these people. So while I made it, my, even though I wasn't guiding him that week, so I wasn't tied to him with a rope, we were pretty much in the same area. We were spending time in the same mountain huts and things. And I made it my job every evening to be sat next to him. I wanted to hear those stories, and I wanted to know what made the man tick. And uh, it was over a conversation one evening, and I think he was thinking about climbing Everest, and I happened to say, well you do realise that within climbing circles, Everest perhaps doesn't have the cachet that it perhaps has in a public domain. And Rand was like, oh, wow, why? You know, mm, well, what does? I said, well, in the Alps, you know, the north face of the Eiger is still considered a benchmark climb. If you climb the north face of the Eiger in Switzerland, you have progressed on from a budding want-to-be alpinist to credibility. And that clearly uh, lodged in the back of his mind. He attempted Everest in 2005, and after his failed Everest attempt, he wasn't with me in 2005, I got an email or a telephone call from him asking to meet up. And we embarked on a four or five year program to get him from where he was to the top of the north face of the Eiger. Uh, which we ultimately successfully did, and as a not a byproduct, but the reason to do that was the fundraising for Mary Curie Cancer Care. And we j just on that one particular expedition, because the whole project went on for a number of years, but from the IGA alone, it was I forget some like 1.7, close to two million pounds. Uh, got got raised uh, on the back of our efforts. Which you talk about that being a sort of a four five year project when when you the first time you went to Everest how long did it take you to train and prepare what's your training like what do you do and how do you prepare for uh, well, well but, 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 but back in 2004 um, nothing uh, I, I was living in um, when I when was I living in 2000 oh, maybe I was and I moved to France then. I was either living and working in France in Chamonix in the French Alps or I was just about to move there and uh, I was super active. I was out climbing, mountaineering, running, cycling, pretty much 24-7. So there was no real need for me to 
hone in on my training at all. It's a little bit different now, I'm older, and I know it's a bit of a cliche, but the body takes longer mm. to recover. Um, the, you know, things are slowing down. I'm 47 now, and I think up here, I still think I'm 21, but my body, most mornings, will tell me as I but you're not. <laughs> as start to sort of creak out of bed that I'm not. No, you're, you're absolutely right. So, yeah, it's a little bit different now. So um, when you go, um, you know, you talk in the book about base camp and camp two and all these different places. Talk me through. So, you, how do you get to, to base camp? Uh, well, the, the the way that uh, that I genuinely get to base camp with a team is you, know, you track. So you arrive in Kathmandu. Fantastic uh, city. Uh, it really is. It's very vibrant, noisy, dusty, dirty. Everything that you would expect from something like Kathmandu. Uh, we spend a few days there, and then, uh, depending exactly how we run in the expedition, we then fly to a air, little airport called Lukla, which is a, an airport essentially built by funds raised by Sir Edmund Hillary, the, the guy that first climbed uh, Everest with uh, Tenzin Norgay. Uh, and there's some wonderful pictures. I was looking at them on Twitter the other day. Uh, and it was built in 63, I think it was, or 67. No, I think it was 63. And there's pictures of, of the locals. And, and they, they are literally out there walking up and down this strip which has been built, just packing it down. And certainly when I first landed there, it was still a rubble strip. It wasn't tarmac. Nowadays, it's tarmac. But it is totally out there. It's inclined about... I want to say 11 degrees. Right. It's, it's, the, the planes come in, they, they, they hit down, there's no instrument landing, it's all line of sight. They come down and hit down, it's hard in reverse, and there's a brick wall at the end because that is the hillside. And they come in and turn around and you get out. And then they'll take off, they come back down, they stand at the top, they rev like you've nothing heard. The whole plane is shaking and the door to the cockpit's open. And you can see, with only small twin propeller dorniers, and you can look down the runway and you can see the, the pilots and you, you, you literally, you know, full throttle, brakes on, and then it brakes off and this thing will thunder wow. down the runway and it was flat and then it goes <laughs> And then hopefully airborne. It's the most dangerous part of the whole expedition. <laughs> it, it, it seriously is. Uh, it, it's meant to be the, the world's most dangerous commercial wow. airfield in the world. I don't know quite how they quantify that, but it's, pretty scary uh, and, and then you walk for seven eight days to get to Everest base camp which is where our main adventure would begin I mean for many many people and it's such an amazing thing to do for many people they will trek to base camp and then come back again and that in its own right is spectacular what well, is one of the top and treks you, in you the know, world you talk about arriving at the summit at sort of 7 15 or something in yeah. the morning um, is that something, is that because of weather conditions that you get up really early? What well, we, we actually leave about half past nine, ten o'clock at night, and we climb right through the night. And it's, it's a number of reasons for it. It's um, what happened in 1996, there was a big disaster, 11th of May 1996, and I think in total 11, I think it was 11 climbers lost their lives. And on the back of that, something called IGO 8000, uh, yeah, big working guidelines yep. for commercial expeditions and one of the things that was highlighted was that due to the time of summits occurring there wasn't that much time to get down in daylight and it doesn't really matter where you're guiding a client or a person friend colleague whatever there is a there's de de definitely a cutoff where a client starts to lose power. So it's normally about 12 hours. You can normally get about 12 hours out of a client, much more than 12 hours, and the enthusiasm, fitness levels, nutrition, whatever it is, starts to drop off. That is significantly compounded if it's then getting dark. And not only is it getting dark, it's gonna be getting cold on Everest, seriously cold. So you've got a client who's, who's weak, he's dehydrated, um, he's, you know, low on energy, He's tired, or, he, or she's tired, so far out of their comfort zone, and now it's getting dark and cold. Way better to start in the middle of the night, do the dark, cold, get that done and dusted, and it leaves enough time, hopefully energy, but above all, daylight, 
to get down if there's a hiccup because you don't want to be coming down in the dark. And you say you, you take one client at a time. I do now, yeah. I, I work in a very bespoke manner. I, I work one-on-one. -on -one. Lots of reasons why. But essentially, in a nutshell, two reasons. One, I believe it's safer. And two, it enhances the client's overall journey, fun, success rate. They're going to have a way better time. One on but you one, also the meet the family, don't you? Before you, I mean, oh, I invest you myself in the whole thing. Right. It, it, it's, it's arguably going to be one of the biggest things that individual ever does. It's dangerous. They may not come home. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of pride. You want to get it right because you know a, 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 a hiccup. People could lose fingers or toes to, to frostbite, or you know, God forbid, they may die. Uh, so, everybody, so everybody needs to know that and be invested yeah. in the why. Why are we doing it? Um, and how long would you normally put aside for a trip? Oh, nowadays about five weeks. So because one, one on one you can streamline in certain places. I use helicopters quite a lot. And so we, we would helicopter to Namchi Bazaar. So that saves two days at the start. We normally helicopter out from base camp at the end. That saves another three days. Um, you're not working to the lowest denominator within the group. Uh, I get to know the client very well, so I, I genuinely know how quickly they'll bounce back when they're tired. I, I know where they're going to, you know, if they go silent, then I know what that means. If, if they're not eating enough or drinking enough, I can normally pick those signs up. So I can really micromanage uh, a client on that mountain to eat the very best out of them. I can raise their performance beyond what they are expecting because we know one another. We have that meaningful relationship with that person so i know all the little nuances you know if if they get really chatty going through the ice wall perhaps they're scared and i'll pick up on that or if they go silent they're hungry or whatever it may yeah. be and then you can deal with it and it can streamline the expedition most expeditions are eight nine ten weeks and, and we do it in half that time and when you so you've been up everest a phenomenal 14 times. 14 times now um, i'm going to show total ignorance here kenton is, do you go the same route? I, I, I do, yeah. yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah. And, and there's a number of reasons why. Um, so I climb on the Nepalese side. Mm -hmm. I, I, I love Nepal. I love the people. I love the culture. Uh, I think it's, you know, it's a beautiful hike to get to base camp. Uh, and I know it really well. I know it intimately. And when you work in, in an environment which is so dangerous, I do think you need everything on your side. And having that knowledge of the route, knowing what's behind the next stone, behind the next corner, you take out one of the unknowns. I, I always say, control the controllables to your best possible ability. And that leaves enough bandwidth to then deal with the uncontrollables, the unknown that's going to come in and sideswipe you when you least expect it. And knowing the route intimately is one of the controllables. Right. So by people say to me, well, it must be boring. Of course it's not boring. Look, look, look at the view for a start. But it's different every year. The, the route is slightly different. The conditions are different. The people are different. Or the, the client is different. The court, the Sherpa team is the same. No, it, it's different every single time. You, you speak very fondly of your Sherpa. Um, I don't know how you pronounce his name. Oh, well, uh, you're probably refer referring to Dorji, Dorji Gelgin. Yeah. 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 Little powerhouse, amazing man. And so, and, and tell me, what, what is the? I'm going. To, I know nothing about yeah. this. Yeah. I know gathered. that. <laughs> um, but what what is the role of your Sherpa to you? Uh, all round hero, legend. Uh, totally. You you can't do what we do commercially without the Sherpas. They are the backbone of every single expedition. A commercial one at least uh you know they put all the tent platforms in place they'll carry all the oxygen for the clients to put it all in place they essentially fix the line carry all the food all the loads they, you know, they, they are yeah the powerhouses of that mountain if you took them out the equation you probably see less than one percent summit success rate wow um, yeah they, they are legendary in their strength in their humility, in their fun. I mean, if you see, they'll carry, especially at the end of the expedition where they're trying to clear camps, they will carry 50, 60, 70 kilos down the mountain. I mean, these loads are so big, I can't lift them. And they will carry them down from camp two, uh, sometimes dragging 
Um, so they might have a big rucksack and they'll drag a load in the snow to the point where it gets steep and then they'll drop it and come back for it. And they'll come into, into base camp utterly exhausted. You know, they've got big down suits on because they're trying to not carry it. and It's, it's sweat. They sit down and they grab a cup of tea and then this big smile will come on their faces. And it is, there's, no, uh, there's no moaning or complaining. It's, I would say it's honest hard work. It's, it's beyond hard work. I mean, these guys work, work their fingers to the bone um, for, for, and for, for the clients. Do you tend to use the same Sherpa? I try to keep the core team together, okay. yeah. yeah. So I work with Dorji. I, I must have summited Everest with Dorji 10, 11 times maybe. So, yeah. Amazing. You, you write in this book a, a, a very moving story about, um, well, well, there's two parts to it because you were going to do the Triple Crown. Um, oh, the three you peaks. Go, you were going to go up. You were going to go up Everest, and your client. Yeah, Kula Abayoli. Yeah, yes, uh, get yeah out like of Nigeria. A, um, a tribal leader of uh, in uh, Nigeria didn't turn up. Uh, long story, but the politics of Nigeria blew up, uh, and he was. He's a fascinating man. So his father. We go off on a slight tangent here, but his father was elected president of Nigeria in the first three elections, but before he could take power. Uh, the military stepped in, um, and he never saw the light of day again. So he was thrown in, in jail, and forget how long, it's something like seven years later, they released a body. Um, and all sorts of people were lobbying for his relief, Desmond Tutu, uh, Clinton, I think, stepped in, certainly Richard Branson. Got, anyway, a load of people got, got involved. Uh, and then Kohler uh, was very, um, so he was number one son, um, but also became quite ingrained in Nigerian politics, for better or for worse. I mean, Nigeria, very corrupt, uh, you know, poor living standards, et cetera, et cetera. And Kola was meant to be my client that year. This is 2013. And, and, and politics blew up. I mean, he's always volatile in Nigeria, but it really blew up. And he was a no-show. He was literally, I was at the airport. Having paid for everything. Uh, yeah, having paid for everything. And it doesn't get off the plane. And then I managed to get a, like a manifesto, a passenger manifesto, and he wasn't on it. And I, oh God, well, you know, what do I do now? Do I go home? Which would have been perhaps a sensible thing, got young children, and, or do I stay and, and perhaps selfishly act out some of my own ambition, which became known as Triple Crown, climbing the three mountains that make up the Everest Massif, um, which we eventually did do, uh, not through a certain amount of heart, heartache and uh, hard work. Well, and you actually had to, you were resuscitating somebody for a couple of hours on your own, I think, weren't you, on the mountain? Yeah, I would, I would use the term resuscitate quite loosely, because it, <laughs> it didn't work. The guy, unfortunately, Mr Lee, uh, passed away. Um, I think it was always going to be a case, so he was suffering from acute mountain sickness, both pe pulmonary and cerebral edema. So it's essentially sort of fluid on the lungs, yeah. uh, fluid on the brain, which then, well, you, you, you got to know better than I do, uh, which then puts a pressure on the brain. And I know we had stuck him with dexamethasone, which is a steroid-based drug, uh, and he did respond to that at one stage. He'd been there for about three or four days by the time I got involved. Um, and I essentially took over from, um, I think it was an American climber. Uh, I spent the night with him, uh, but yeah, he sadly passed away at, have you suffered altitude sickness yourself? I, I've, I've suffered minor altitude sickness, you know, headaches, nausea, lack of enthusiasm, um, which you could put down on. <laughs> I mean, so it sounds like <laughs> a Friday night. On a yeah. Sunday morning. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, it's certainly me this Sunday morning. Um, but um, yeah, the, the altitude is one of those really interesting things in so much. It doesn't matter how fit you are, it, it's a leveller. And. You, know, you could be James Cracknell, you know, super fit Olympic athlete, or you could be you know, an obese, chain smoking, whiskey drinking, couch potato. And altitude isn't fussy. No, it's not fussy. In, in fact, the, the couch potato might actually fare better yeah. than James Cracknell. I mean, you just never know. Um, did you see James set a record uh, this weekend? Did he? Yeah, he was uh, on his rower, so on his ergo. I think it was the British uh, marathon record on a rower. Like two, uh, two and a half hours or something, pulling on an ergo. He's like, oh my God, the guy's an animal. 
absolute animal. Uh, but, but attitude is, a, is one of these things. And a really interesting study back in 2007, the Cold War Extreme team, a bunch of doctors. Yeah. Uh, Mike Wocott was, well, Mike Wocott, Sundit Dillon, um, uh, Hugh Montgomery was involved, Jeremy Windsor. Uh, at one stage, Mike Stroud was involved in, in the build-up to it. He went to Choi Oya, the sixth highest mountain in the world. And they were doing this fascinating study. You can find it on BBC. I think it was Panorama or Horizon, one of them. And they were looking into what the body does to adapt to a low oxygen environment. Because one of the, and correct me if I'm wrong here, I feel like I'm on thin ice here <laughs> with a doctor sat opposite me. One of the things which is a problem in intensive care is the patient won't necessarily die from their trauma injury. They would die because the body shuts down. Something to do with oxygen absorption by the body. Yep, and it shuts right. down. <laughs> and so they, what they were trying to work out is how come people with what looks like incredibly low oxygen stats in a very low oxygen and pressure environment, how can they survive? What does the body do? And then... It's a massive study. I mean, they lugged a bloody uh, exercise bike to 8,000 metres. They took uh, a blood sample from one of the climbers, his doctor, Ortega, is it called um, Thingy uh, Archery? Femoral Archery. Femoral Archery. They took blood out of there, ran it down to Denny. He's got a centrifuge thing. But then they're, so they're looking at the, the oxygen saturation levels. But beyond simply using a, a post-ox metre, which is notoriously inaccurate. So they run these samples down. Uh, it's on TV, it's amazing. And she's got it in this machine and it's doing whatever the machine does and the first sample comes out and then he's like, whoa, this can't be right. So she puts a second sample in and it's almost identical. He's like, oh my goodness, if this was at sea level, this person would be dead. Amazing. And they're not. They're sat down at the south summit. They didn't quite do it on the summit, but it's still at 8,700 metres above sea level. And the auction stat was... Uh, I forget the exact thing. I mean, the lowest I have ever seen was Victoria Pendleton. She had 28, an oxygen saturation, saturation level of 28. And she was still semi-functioning. And when I say functioning, I don't mean holding my hand. She walked from her tent to the mess tent before saying, oh, I don't feel very well, and essentially collapsing. And then we got the O2 on her. And, you know, be, um, I mean, I, I, I've had oxygen levels in the 40s. Wow. High 40s. So what, so what the Cold or Extreme team were trying to work out what the body does to cope with that, and then if they could replicate it in some manner in the hospitals, maybe they can buy more time mm -hmm. to, do the you know, to deal with the trauma or yeah. the disease or whatever it is. Uh, a fascinating uh, exercise. I could sit and talk doing. to you forever. Listen, 14 times off Everest, what's next? <laughs> well, who knows? I mean, well, obviously, I, I was meant to be on Everest uh, last month. That's been cancelled. I was meant to be on pa in Pakistan pretty much now. That's been cancelled. Um, it looks unlikely that Everest will open up this autumn. Uh, Nepal at the moment is in a very hard lockdown. Oh. And they look, unfortunately, it looks like they're just on that start of the curve that we experienced 10, 12 weeks ago. Definitely going back to Everest next spring, so that's a certain. I'm trying to get a trip off the ground, some unclimbed virgin peaks in Antarctica. Uh, so it'll be our winter to their summer, so that'll be like January time. So quite a lot going on. In the meantime, we're obviously the same place here. Got cool conversations. Yes. Trying to support the guys at the Barn Theatre. So that's really exciting. Got some really cool people on that. Looking after two children at home. Um, I would say looking after the wife, but I think it's the other way around. <laughs> I think she looks after me. And how does your wife manage when you're kind of doing these crazy expeditions? Well, uh, interesting enough, they have this thing they call the Three Amigos, and they become a very tight unit without me. Uh, and she, she's absolutely fantastic, Jazz. Um, just has a, this capability of maintaining... Well, I think they probably do better without me. They, they, she calls me the third child. <laughs> Uh, and and she, she is absolutely right. I've come in, fun time Freddie, been away for six weeks. It's like, ah, daddy's back. Ah. And I hiccup all the structure and, and Jazz is like, oh, God. Back. <laughs> go back to Everest. Uh, yeah, yeah, go on. <laughs> it's all back to Everest. Um, but no, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And you know, they, they cope very well without me, uh, it seems. I mean, it tugs at my heartstrings. 
Um, but I think that just shows the flexibility um, of, of children. Yeah. You know, they, they, okay, well, daddy's gone. So we'll deal with it and get on, and daddy will come back in four, five, six weeks' time, and we'll take off where we left off and they're like right let's go camping or let's do this or that do that and it's like, oh look thank so. you so much for your time no my um, pleasure um, just amazing have a little read guys what is it one man's everest one man's everest yeah quite hard to get Perfect. hold of so especially Perfect the hardback book. ones uh, well, we I flogged them all to try and make some funds around at the barn, so i'll have to give it back but um thank you so much for your time it's no my really, pleasure really good to chat to you thank you so, guys, that's it for this week. Um, please come back next week. We'll be back with another guest on Monday at 3 o'clock. But until then, stay safe and stay well.